Thank you, David, for that introduction. Greetings, colleagues. Are you ready to take the lead? Yes. Louder? Yes. That is our theme this week, and one that will carry us through the next four years. In our context, all of us together, what does it mean to take the lead? It means advancing our profession, using our collective voice to change the global narrative to improve the status and image of our profession as educators. It means promoting democracy, human and trade union rights, putting ourselves and our unions at the forefront of the movements that fight for democratic values and defend human and trade union rights on behalf of our students, our members and the communities we serve. And it means ensuring quality, free public education for all, standing and demanding accountability of our governments to support safe, inclusive quality education for all. To guide our discussions, shape our resolve and inspire our actions, we have designed this Congress to include all our voices in a series of breakout sessions. We're going to discuss union renewal, asserting the relevance of our unions in defining education policy to support the development, to support the development uh, of the, uh, I beg your pardon. We're going to discuss union renewal, asserting the relevance of our unions in defining education policy to support the achievement of SDG4 and organising and mobilising young members in the work of the union, finding ways of supporting those who are new and not so new in the profession. And in that regard, for this World Congress, the EI Executive Board requested all member organisations present delegations comprising at least 50% females. And I'm very pleased to report to you that the numbers of women attending World Congress this year from Africa, Asia Pacific and Latin American regions has more than doubled since 2011. With, with significant increases also notable for Europe and North America and the Caribbean. It still remains the case though that there is a gender, gendered leadership gap and most women attend as observers rather than delegates. I can also report that the numbers of delegates under the age of 35 has risen at this Congress from one person in Ottawa to 65 here in Bangkok. <clears throat> Colleagues, this week we're going to discuss the importance of living our values exchanging experiences of union-led interventions against violence, harassment and abuse in the workplace, raising our collective professional voices to address political interference with education, defend our professional and academic freedom and promote inclusive education systems in the face of glowing isolationism. We're going to talk about campaigns and efforts to move our goals on the ground confronting commercialization and privatization by deepening and expanding EI's global response. We are also developing a global framework on professional teaching standards. Likewise, we need to stay focused on the sustainable development goals, including goal four on education. Colleagues, we're going to examine new political landscapes. In a session of defending our profession in the global arena, Participants will share and develop strategies to enhance the impact of EI and member organisations' advocacy. The policies adopted by national authorities on the financing of education, curriculum, professional standards or working conditions are increasingly influenced by international organisations. You know them. The World Bank, UNESCO, OECD, the Global Partnership for Education and the ILO, among others. But we must grow our collective effort to influence these policies. We will be hearing about and discussing technology and its impact on quality and the future of teaching. 
On the subject of growing and strengthening our influence, it is an appropriate point to note that for our first 25 years, Education International was guided by our founding General Secretary. Not only is he a pioneer of education trade unionism, he connected us to the world through the International Trade Union Confederation and the Trade Union Advisory Committee of the OECD, and as chair of the Council of the Global Union. When we build together, we do so on the foundation laid under the stewardship of our colleague and my very good friend, our voice to the world for a quarter century, and now our Emeritus General Secretary, Fred Van Leeuwen. Colleagues, no discussion of the future can be conducted outside the context of an emergency situation that touches all of us. It is critical to determine how we as educators and unionists and leaders respond to the greatest threat to our planet and perhaps the human race as a whole. We know the basic facts about climate change. Burning fossil fuels emits carbon dioxide, a greenhouse gas that traps heat in the atmosphere. As global surface temperatures increase, the planet's glaciers and ice sheets melt. Sea levels rise. Extreme weather occurrences intensify and become more frequent. In 2013, the United Nations reported that without major reductions in emissions, the sea level rise could be as much as one metre by 2100. Scientists more recently tell us these estimates might be too conservative, that the number may be more than six feet or nearly two metres. And this is not a phenomenon happening somewhere else, from Mississippi to Madagascar to Melbourne. We all share a variety of the same increasing threat. But nowhere on this planet is that threat more apparent than in the Asia-Pacific region where we are today. Half of the 10 countries said to be most vulnerable to climate change are in this region. India, Pakistan, the Philippines, Bangladesh and Sri Lanka. And in the Cook Islands and in Fiji and Tonga, coral reefs are bleaching and native fish and shellfish are disappearing as sea levels rise. The intrusion of saltwater on farmland disrupts crops and forces internal relocations. In Papua New Guinea, sea levels are rising double the global average rate and incidences of malaria increase each year. In Tuvalu, rising salt water threatens food staples like coconut, pulaka, and taro. In December 2005, in a village called Latar on the Torres Strait Islands in Northern Australia, its inhabitants were declared by the United States to be the Earth's first climate refugees. The plantations of coconut palms were flooded and rising seas threatened their homes. The village was displaced several hundred metres to escape the rising water. Then in 2014, to the north and east in the Solomon Islands, a provincial capital of Chushul was forced to relocate. Situated less than two metres above sea level and faced with rising seas, the community consulted with engineers, scientists and planners and decided to build a new town on an adjacent mainland where the population with all its services and facilities would be moved in stages. And in the same year, rescue plans began to be drawn for the disappearance of a collection of nearby coral atolls, the nation of Kiribati. Colleagues, the world study foretold a future that could already be seen for the residents living less than two metres above sea level. Roads washed out continuously, disrupted supplies of fish from degraded coral reefs, increasing erosion, loss of fresh water, and increased incidence of disease. The government bought nearly 6,000 acres in Fiji, more than 1,600 kilometers away from Kiribati, where higher elevation and more stable shoreland made it less vulnerable. They called it migration with dignity, urging the nation's 110,000 residents to consider moving. 
And in Bangladesh, a National Geographic report in January said, over the last decade, nearly 700,000 Bangladeshis were displaced on average each year by natural disasters. As sea levels rise, erosion, salinity intrusion, crop failures, and repeat inundation make life along the coast untenable. Overall, the number of Bangladeshis displaced by the varied impacts of climate change could reach 13.3 million by 2050, making it the country's number one driver of internal migration, according to a March 2018 World Bank report. Estimates are that by 2050, some 200 million people worldwide will be driven from their homes by climate change. And so far, the UN estimates that 80% of people displaced by climate change are women. And why is that? Their roles as primary caregivers and providers of food and fuel make them more vulnerable to flooding and drought. Studies show women are more likely to experience poverty and to have less socioeconomic power than men, making disaster recovery more difficult, lowering women's life expectancy more than men's and killing them more often at a younger age. Climate change is very personal to me, as I know it is to many of you. It is devastating my home country. In Australia, there is no longer a reliable ceiling on the statistics for events such as the hottest summer, the wettest season, or the fiercest winds. We experienced temperatures over 48 degrees this summer just a few months ago. That's 120 degrees Fahrenheit. And the forecast for heat waves is simple, more frequent and more severe. The Great Barrier Reef, one of the natural wonders of the world, suffered unprecedented mass be bleaching in 2016 and in 2017. This is a resource critical to ocean life and food production. And now there are serious concerns about saving the reef at all. And under the current policies of the re-elected Australian government, the nation's emissions from fossil fuels and industry are increasing rather than the 15 to 17% decrease required to meet its global agreement. Australia will no longer contribute to a United Nations fund used to combat climate change. And much like the American administration, which has withdrawn completely from the Paris Agreement, the Australian government has doubled down on its commitment to coal and fossil fuels. This conservative pro-market government actually wants to fund a privately owned coal mine. Colleagues, the fight is on. The president of Vanuatu said it simply. This is really about claiming for the damages to shift the costs of climate protection back onto fossil fuel companies, the financial institutions and the governments that actively and knowingly created this existential threat to my country. In May, a group of Torres Strait Islanders filed a first of its kind human rights complaint at the UN against the government of Australia over its lack of action on climate change. And local governments there launched a national petition calling on the government to increase climate adaptation and mitigation. It calls on the government to commit to emergency resilience projects like seawalls, invest long-term in adaptation measures, and achieve net zero emissions before 2050 by phasing out coal for domestic electricity and export. These actions follow similar actions filed in the Netherlands, the Philippines and in the United States. But colleagues, the most significant thing we've seen is the youth mobilization sparked by a Swedish student last year, Greta Thunberg. <laughs> and her Fridays for the Future movement. In March, an estimated 1.4 million people in 120 countries most of them teenage students, participated in a global strike demanding politicians take action against climate change. In May, a global climate, a global climate strike involved more than a million people in more than 1,600 cities. Again, a significant number 
being students from primary school with parents and family to secondary and higher education students. EI and affiliates around the world supported their actions for embracing hope and exposing the pathetic weakness of many democracies, including my own, to the most compelling needs of the population. Their determination and commitment are exactly what we need at this critical moment. Evidence of a democratic process that is alive and ready to be inspired by those who simply say, we will take the lead. And now, colleagues, it's our turn. We have rightfully called out when private interests put profits ahead of people in education. How should we react when some of these same interests put profits ahead of the planet, ahead of the very survival of the human species? We have been part of the international awareness and accountability regarding the Me Too movement. What is our role now when the assaults and indignities against the planet are equally systematic and overtly patriarchal? We've gone up against governments that devalue our profession and the tools and conditions of teaching and learning for ourselves and our students. We know the value of organising, mobilising and persisting. We are teachers and education professionals. We not only convey truths, we have an absolute responsibility now to call out lies. We need to take the lead. Climate justice must have an education face and a teacher's voice in every area of the world. Just a couple of years ago, the Global Education Monitoring Report examined education in the context of sustainability. And the very first words of the report are chilling. And I quote, the planet Earth is in a dire state. The report acknowledged the power of education as a tool for raising awareness about the global climate emergency and for combating climate change. It said education matters for all aspects of sustainable development and recommended that education ministries be linked with ministries of health, gender, environment and labour. And why ministries? Why do those who monitor conditions year after year focus on the responsibilities of government? Well, here is why, and this is the fundamental issue to us all as educators. Too many governments around the world are failing miserably in their responsibilities to their people. Basic responsibilities to promote equity and equal rights, to collect taxes, to provide infrastructure, to regulate private economic activity and invest in their own people and natural resources. We've seen it so clearly Governments that surrender or who are paid off to facilitate a notion that education can be delivered more cheaply and officially, efficiently by the free market. International bodies that fund education based on one-size-fits-all online programs and standardised te testing. And the so-called edupreneurs rushing to paint the promising opportunities of artificial intelligence into a landscape of teacherless classrooms. When the idea takes hold that the public good and rights are commodities and that markets are the best determinants of government action, it harms us all. <clears throat> Colleagues, the inaction of politicians and government in the face of profiteering is not neutral. It is deliberate. It is reckless, especially by high-income countries like my own. Their failure and thus their complicity are our responsibility and our challenge and can, can no longer be tolerated. Recent actions by our students on climate change have only exposed this spineless behaviour once again. The question is, Will their mobilisation help inspire a reinvigoration of the democratic process for a just transition towards a climate resilient and low carbon economy? These are perilous times for democracy, 
aggressive nationalism is on the rise. Disinformation is being used as a weapon and division is being sown for private benefit. We cannot talk about the region where we gather today and address the subject of division without mentioning the deadly divide that zealots and racists are seeking to foster amongst us with terror and bloodshed. In March, a white supremacist went live on Facebook as he gunned down more than 50 people in attacks on two separate mosques in Christchurch, New Zealand. And Easter, on Easter Sunday, bomb attacks against churches and hotels by religious extremists in Sri Lanka killed hundreds. These are the terrifying consequences of a world where bigotry and racism are being, being, becoming normalised, where rhetoric and threats and the politics of fear, division and xenophobia and the organising principles for politicians and their parties are the organising uh, principles for politicians and their parties and policy tools for their governments. But truth matters. Despite alienation and pessimism, the need for facts is clearer than ever before. If humanity is to have a hopeful future, then every child, indeed every adult, needs to be more than an enthusiastic learner and seeker of truth. We need to be fighters against lies and darkness. And we know the truth. Climate change is science, and maths, and language, and geography, and government, and history, and literature. Its lessons belong in all schools with full and free discussions about the planet's status, the consequences to life as well as possible solutions, including the choices involved in slowing and stopping the growth of carbon emissions necessary to save our planet. Rather than focus only on the politically expedient approaches of changing consumer behaviour and of consumer and citizen behaviour, schools must be spaces for learning about the power and privilege that a handful of humans are given to perpetuate climate injustice and stifle opposition. We know the truth also about the politics of fear. All of us can hear the war drums beating. Earlier this year, the bulletin of atomic scientists set their doomsday clock at two minutes till midnight, the closest it has been to the nuclear apocalypse sorry, since its inception, ex inception in 1947. The reason is the twin threats of nuclear weapons and climate change which have been exacerbated this past year by the increased use of information warfare to undermine democracy around the world, putting the future of civilization in extraordinary danger. While governments fund military machinery with hundreds of billions, the 40 billion needed to fund equitable and free education for all is denied. As citizens, we resist and seek redress of this imbalance. As unionists, we organise to change these priorities in our communities and in our capitals. But as educators, knowing that all wars are fought against children, we have an obligation to widen the minds and deepen the critical abilities of current and future generations. In the office of my union, there is a quote by Charlotte Bronte on the wall that I see every day. Prejudices, it is well known, are most difficult to er eradicate from the heart whose soil has never been loosened or fertilised by education. In too many countries, education is narrowed down to producing a workforce, the curricula driven by testing. But now, influential organisations, as well as a growing number of internationally renowned academics, are closing ranks with Education International to expose this narrowing trend and promote a pedagogy with resources to build citizenship and critical thinking 
and the ability to craft collaborative approaches to the widest range of human concerns and experiences. Even the OECD has recognised the need to expand students' skills and competencies beyond the standard literacy, numeracy and science indicators to include creative thinking. The man who runs the program is Andreas Schleicher and he has acknowledged the current limitations saying, we are less concerned about reflecting what schools currently do. We are more concerned with what kinds of cognitive, socio-economic, emotional skills young people require to be successful tomorrow. And the truth is, he is finally saying only what has been expressed for decades. The United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child obliges us and our governments to ensure that the education of the child shall be directed to the preparation of the child for responsible life in a free society, in the spirit of understanding, peace, tolerance, equality of sexes, and friendship amongst all people, national and religious groups, and persons of indigenous origin. Curricula and teaching and learning materials need to be urgently revised and improved to address the environmental and social crises our students face, and give all learners the skills and knowledge needed in transition to new sustainable economies and employment. Researchers and academics must have the academic freedom and resources necessary to continue to expose the threats and highlight solutions by teaching the science of climate change. Our vocational education and training programs must provide the necessary skills for a just transition to a new green economy. We are all familiar with that variously attributed quote that a lie can travel halfway around the world before the truth can put its shoes on. Sounds like the definition of Twitter and WhatsApp, doesn't it? But it describes the challenge educators face in our time, not only to understand propaganda, but to be media literate in a world full of spin and lies. As important as curricula and materials are, educators must also have the freedom to teach. Our creativity should be encouraged, not blocked or diverted. Our professional autonomy is central in the struggle to build a better world. <clears throat> Education International is a global federation of 391 education unions in 176 countries, bringing together some 32 million educators. Individually, of course, each of us has our own aspirations and professional story. But we are united in the belief that quality education is the key to a better future for our children, for our communities, for our countries. In 2013, our membership mounted the largest campaign in our history and one of the largest global campaigns ever. At the, as the United Nations moved to establish global sustainable development goals, we led the campaign for a standalone goal on education. Our message was simple. Access to education has been improving in the earliest 21st century, but not nearly enough. And it is as clear to us and to many others that fi the fight for access was missing a critical point. And that was the word quality. The objective needed to be access to a quality education for every student, defined very clearly by three pillars, quality teaching and quality tools and quality environments for teaching and learning. <clears throat> EI affiliates in every region of the world responded with an unprecedented mobilisation. Now the world has the education goal to ensure inclusive and equitable quality education and promote lifelong opportunities for all. And inside all of those goals are specific targets and a crucial one for the education goal is ensure all learners acquire knowledge and skills needed to promote sustainable development. We will not rest until all girls and boys have access to complete free primary and secondary education taught by qualified teachers. <clears throat> the
That is what government's committed to. That is what we demand, nothing less. And that is a direct char charge to us as teachers and support personnel at every level. Teachers matter more than ever, and we can be the world's most significant force in a movement integrated for quality education, justice and sustainability. We are empowering our students with the problem-solving skills to make a just transition, to elevate the focus on rights and equity, to negotiate new global markets and technologies and navigate a potential carbon-neutral economy with meaningful and productive work, jobs that we can't even imagine today. The ability to adapt and collaborate, the social and emotional skills that students need to transition into new ways of working and building the future. These are the transitions that need to be developed and mapped and guided by the teaching profession. Colleagues, sometimes you make a careful decision about which direction to go. Sometimes leadership is about who is next in line or who has yet to take a turn. In our time now, with democracy literally locked in struggle for survival, in the face of despots and reaction. We have no choice. There is no ground to give. There is no wisdom in the, wake, in the waiting. It is time to take the lead. Thank you.